12. According to different myths, there are many reasons for the dark side of nature. In the Christian myth, it is the result of the fall of Adam and Eve. In other myths, a split occurs in the divine realm. In still others, it is the disappointment of the goddess of nature. An Eskimo version with different variations is to be found in many circumpolar tribes. Sedna, their mother goddess or goddess of nature, lives under the sea and produces the whales, seals, fish, and so on. And the Eskimos who live on these animals pray to her for luck in hunting. Some versions say that Sedna was a strange woman who did not want to marry an ordinary man. A shooter from far away came one day, either in human form or as a seagull, and she followed him. But when she arrived at his home, she was deeply disappointed, for there was no food. He did not look after her and neglected her completely. So Sedna sent a message to her father to fetch her home again. The father came and, in some versions, killed the unsatisfactory lover or husband. In revenge, the seagulls, or the ghost of the dead husband, caused a storm to overtake them on their way back to the boat. In order to save his own life, the father threw his daughter into the sea. She held on to the side of the boat, but he took a knife and cut off her fingers so that she fell into the sea. Afterward, in revenge, either by magic or through talking to them, she had dogs to attack her father, and they ate his nose or hands and feet or both. The father and daughter, who had crippled each other, lived together under the sea. Sedna then became the great goddess of nature and was benevolent to human beings and was also the mistress of death. She was the hidden goddess of nature, having the stories of life and death. The souls of the dead Eskimos went to live with her at the bottom of the sea. If they had behaved well, they had a relatively good life. But if not, they were tortured by animals. Sedna and her crippled father stayed in a hut under the sea, and from time to time she accumulated a lot of lice on her head. A shaman had to dive down and rid her of them, and then fertility returned to the land of the living. So every time when it happened that the whales or the seal did not come at the right time, then the medicine man had to see to her head. Her evil side was due to her disappointment in love. Her father and her husband both let her down, so that she never attained a positive connection with the male principle. There is a similar doctrine in the Kabbalah which teaches that the unsatisfactory aspect of reality exists because the Shekinah is separated from God, and that if this feminine principle were reunited with God, the world order would be restored. So ethical people who strive toward higher consciousness, try to restore the Erogamos, working toward a reunion of the male and female divine principle. So if we look at different myths, evil is not always due to man's transgression, but to all sorts of different metaphysical causes. It is a very frequent motif that the myths recommend that man should be very tactful in dealing with the evil side of the divine principle. This is what the Old Testament also recommends, namely, the fear of God. If I allow myself to criticize God, it is a kind of inflation, as though God were my brother, or mother nature, my sister, and I intended to put my finger on their sore spots, as I could with a fellow being. But the divinity is not a fellow being whom I can criticize. My neighbor I can criticize if I want, but to criticize God shows a lack of realization of the difference of level. And thus, in the Bible, God advises man to fear him. That is, to keep within certain limits and know that God is not to be judged on a human level, and that we must be fully aware that our human standards do not apply to the divinity. Job held to the fact that God did him an injustice, but he stood by his human standards and did not give in to those friends who tried to convince him that God was right and that he must have been wrong. He was respectful enough to realize that he could not presume to accuse God of injustice. He said it once, and then, I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer, twice, but I will proceed no further. And by that, he adhered to his human standards, knowing that he was a creature with human limitations, with an anthropomorphic view of reality. The Godhead has always been experienced as transcending the human, both in light and in darkness, 
so that not to dig into the dark side would mean recognition of the fact that that is something which one cannot presume to do. That would be a gesture of utter humility. Man cannot make himself the judge of the whole of reality. We are a part of it, and have certain standards of value and instinct by which we live, but we cannot be and are not the final judges, and this we should realize in all modesty and self-limitation. Vazlisa has that modest attitude, and additionally, she has the protection of her doll. The latter we have interpreted as a magical object, so that one can say that she protects herself with a religious ritual in a way which could be compared to that of the Christian who wears a crucifixion for protection. By such a gesture we express that we need divine protection and that we cannot cope with evil with our intellect alone. I think this is a very practical problem in psychotherapy and also naturally, in general, contact with other human beings. If, for instance, you have ever analyzed another person, or even if you have had a non-analytical but deep uh, conversation with someone, an encounter in which you sort out your indifferences without aggression, you know that sometimes you come up against a state of opposition where it is impossible to go any further. In a quarrel, you may have to realize that the other person is absolutely, utterly possessed and incapable of discussing things on a reasonable or human level. That as soon as you touch the subject, the other goes off on a tangent into an utterly possessed state, and you are up against something you cannot deal with, namely a dark archetypal situation. Naturally, that happens quite often to an analyst, for if you touch a deep problem of the analyst's end, you may reach a place where you feel you cannot go further. The contact is completely blocked, and the analyst's end is no longer willing to listen or to accept any of your arguments. If over a long period such a constellation persists, the many people make the mistake of retiring from it with a flow of talk, instead of giving it complete respect and silence. A practical indication is to drop the treatment, but one should not say that the other person is hopelessly onimous or onima possessed, or possessed by evil, or by this or that, and that therefore one must drop the therapy. That is what our ordinary affective human ego would say. The more one wastes affect and words, the worse one gets entangled in the wrong way. One should realize that even if one considers the analyzant to be completely wrong and possessed by evil, possessed by a blindness of some kind, it is not deliberate on his part. It is not his evil will. Nobody is possessed voluntarily. It is a tragic fate which should be respected in silence. So it is better to say that the treatment cannot go on since we are blocked. Obviously, if I cannot help the Analyzand anymore, I am wasting my time, and the Analyzand is wasting time and money, so it would be better to separate in peace. One should respect the evil constellation through silence and not dig into it and talk about it emotionally, but women, in particular, being more interested in relationship than men, again and again commit the mistake of continuing to talk about such emotional constellations and make them much worse in that way. My own bad experiences have taught me that it is much better to have the attitude which people had in antiquity. Namely, if covering one's head and walking away and letting things take their own course, but silently. For even if all one has to say is true, and one could say a great deal that was true, one is digging up more and more darkness and improving nothing. One is not up against human evil, but the evil of nature and the psyche of the other person. So it is eminently practical. And really what Christ meant when he said it, that we should not resist evil, he warned against the all-too-human tendency, the inflation, actually, to pursue shadow problems which are not one's own. One should say, I have done my human best and have not succeeded, but have been shown my own limitations. It is even better not to name the other person's evil. In the ancient Greek civilization and in our Middle Ages, people avoided naming evil powers. Also in most primitive societies it is taboo to talk of ghosts and dark spirits by name. We also say that one should not invoke the devil because if you do, he is there. The mention of the name constellates the object right away, not to mention it would be the religious attitude of respect. One retires respectfully to one's own estates, one's human limitations. Most religious systems where evil is still recognized as an entity, commend such an attitude. 
Jung showed that the great danger of the Christian teaching of the privatio boni, of the non-existence of evil, is that it causes an inflated identification with the good, a wrong kind of inflated optimism. The idea that we can clear up the dark corners of nature and the Godhead has given the white civilization an enormous drive and optimistic elon, but also an inflation, it is a very subtle problem, because if one did not believe in the possibility of cleaning out dark and dusty corners in the human soul, and thus improving the situation of the human being, one could not be an analyst. But when that optimism goes an inch too far, one is inflated. St. Thomas died when writing an article on penitence, which naturally is also the problem of evil. So it is a pretty dangerous thing to touch, if done with the naive optimism with which Christianity has inculcated us, and which Christ himself did not teach. This light, rational attitude is really an inheritance from the Platonic, Neoplatonic, and Stoic philosophies, and not an influx from genuine Christian teaching. Toward the darkness of nature, a fearful and respectful attitude and full awareness of one's own limitations is the right religious attitude. Vaslisa provides us with a model when she asks about certain things in Baba Yaga's hut, but when it comes to the dark hands, she does not inquire, and Baba Yaga compliments her for it, saying that too much knowledge makes you old. One could take that quite literally. When one is young, one pokes into everything out of sheer juvenile optimism and gets some bangs on the head. Slowly, as one becomes older, one retires more into oneself. That also can go too far, or as you know, old people can overdo it by damping young people's ardor over every enterprise, discouraging them by saying it won't work and one shouldn't try. Such skeptical conservatism goes too far. There should be a balance. But if Vaslisa had inquired about those hands, she might have had some horrible experience and lost her Elon for life, and that is something to remember. How much evil can one afford to see without losing one's appetite for life? If one has to, if one's destiny forces one into it, one has to take it. But to load the boat with evil which is not in one's own fate and has been picked up out of sheer curiosity is not recommended. That's why, for instance, most of the really good primitive medicine men do not advertise their activity. They have no therapeutic enthusiasm and do not poke into evil or go about telling people they should go into treatment. They prefer to confine themselves to the evil with which they are actually faced. Only if somebody persecuted by evil comes and asks for help do they unwillingly consent, which shows that they are much more aware of the dangerous living reality of evil and that one should not take on oneself more than is absolutely necessary. It may be, if one likes someone, that one has to share in that person's fate and meet the evil. But otherwise, it is better to let sleeping dogs lie, for the dog might turn out to be a sleeping devil, much better left to sleep. When Vaslisa leaves the hut, she takes with her the skull with the burning eyes. On arriving home, she thinks she will throw it away, but the skull says she should take it to her stepmother. So, though she does not know what it has in mind to do, she does so. Then the skull's glowing eyes stare unceasingly at stepmother and stepsisters until they are burned to ashes. Being stared at all the time would be equivalent to having a bad conscience. One has the constant disagreeable feeling that one cannot hide. There is a beautiful poem by Victor Hugo about Cain, who, after he had killed Abel, had the hallucination that an eye looked at him at all time. He ran to the end of the world trying everywhere to escape, but the eye of God always followed him. In the end, he entered a tomb, pulled the stone lid over, and sat there in the dark. But then he lifted his eyes and saw that God's eye was even in the grave and still watched him. That would be the tortures of a bad conscience. You could say that the absolute knowledge in the human soul knows of good and evil and that one cannot escape. Conscience is not without reason related to the word consciousness. Conscience is a form of ethical consciousness which one cannot escape, even if the police do not catch one. After Vasliza has gone into evil, she consolates this conscience for her enemies. 
After she has been with Baba Yaga and has herself looked into the depths of evil, she constellates this protection for herself, this positive fruit of the very disagreeable job of looking at her own shadow. In general, looking at one's own shadow is purely disagreeable. It is no fun, and the results also are not very amusing. It has one great advantage. The more one knows about one's own wickedness, the more one is able to protect oneself against that of other people. The evil within oneself recognizes evil within the other. If I am naive about my own evil intentions, then I shall fall victim to those of others. Everybody can lie to me and I shall believe them, or they will play tricks on me and I shall fall for it every time and be the poor babe in the wood, the fool who had such good intentions, but whom the evil world has treated badly. That does happen, especially to young people, and generally the naive people. They are really harmed by evil people, but indirectly they themselves are guilty for they haven't sufficiently realized the evil within themselves. If they knew more about that, they would acquire a kind of extrasensory perception for the evil of others. If, as a woman, you know about your own jealousy, you can look at another woman and catch the flicker of jealousy in her eye, and then know that you have to be careful with that woman, that it would be wiser to keep out of her way. But if you do not know what jealousy is, and have never seen your own jealous side, you cannot protect yourself and may do something silly where the other can take advantage of you. It is the same with men. The more one has looked at the mirror and watched one's own face for hate, jealousy, dissatisfaction, etc., the better one can read the other person's face and be wise enough to keep out of the way. One can thus avoid evil, but only by knowing how evil one is oneself, for only then has one an immediate instinctive awareness and recognition. The idealistic fool who gets cheated by everyone and always has bad tricks played on him cannot be helped by pity, but only by being led to his own shadow. Awareness of his own evil will enable him to defend himself better. If you want to become an analyst, naturally one of the most important things is to be able to protect yourself against destructive influences to which you are particularly exposed, as much as a doctor working in the hospital for infectious diseases. Those who have integrated much of their own darkness have a kind of invisible authority, as though they had gained weight and authority, and people do not seem to dare to attack them, instinctively feeling that they would get a slap in return. There are school teachers who have no need to assert themselves by thumping on a table and giving punishments all the time. The children fear them instinctively because they feel the crocodile or whatever stands behind that man and they realize that impertinence could lead to trouble. The master can therefore teach undisturbed in contrast to some young teacher who is full of enthusiasm and naive and innocent. When analyzing school teachers, I have often seen that the more they have obtained insight into their own shadows, the more they have gained some adult quality through which the whole problem of authority fades away. The more one realizes of one's shadow, the more one gets condensed and thus unapproachable. Knowledge of one's dark side serves as a protection. The girl does not burn her stepmother and stepsisters out of revenge, which would only have involved her in her own shadow. That would have been the natural reaction, a tremendous resentment because she had been tortured, but then evil would have spread like wildfire. She has the skull, the destructive thing with her, but it is not her ego who uses it. The skull acts on its own. The revenge takes its natural course, as it were, without her taking part in it. In practical language, that is what is meant by giving somebody who has evil intentions a rope with which to hang himself. For instance, you may have a position which someone else, tremendously ambitious, wants. If you fight the other, it is just a question of ambition against ambition. But if you give up your own ambition and retire and let the other have the post or defend the position only passively, the other is punished in getting the fruit of his own ambition and being eaten up by it. When you give the other enough rope perhaps power, he has the worst possible punishment. He gets eaten up by his own evil. People are driven by their successes, but one can walk away. One is not one's brother's keeper, 
or friend, you must make some effort to discourage him or her, but otherwise do nothing. In the course of nature, evil always burns itself up in the end, and that is letting nature take its course. A human being's shadow generally has to do with greed of some kind, either sex or power or something else. Such greedy libido is fire which burns itself up. People are burnt by their own greed, and it is wise not to interfere with this. In the case of Vaz Lisa, the stepmother and her daughters wanted to destroy her and so sent her to the Baba Yaga. But it is they who are burned up with what they intended for her. So the skull does not represent Vaz Lisa's shadow, but the stepmother and the stepdaughters, which now comes back on them, leaving Vaz Lisa unarmed. Once at Faustnacht, Jung made up a wonderful verse about the poisonous dragon to the effect that if a poisonous dragon appeared, one should not get upset, for the dragon had only forgotten his own fate, that he had to eat himself, the Ouroboros. So you must just remind the dragon of his duty, and he will say, oh yes, and will eat himself up. But you have to remind him, that is, bring a little bit of consciousness into the situation. It doesn't mean letting things go, but putting a little drop of consciousness in and then retiring. Nature will take its own course and ultimately destroy the evil. The positive sea of life within darkness is stronger than the whole darkness, as St. John said when he spoke of the darkness longing for the light. Realization of evil can also have a positive aspect and reinforce one's wish to live. Many people suffer from a kind of apathy. A lack of desire to live can be genuine, coming at the beginning of the fading of vitality or the onset of old age, or as the result of some kind of illness or even an objective necessity to retire from life. But this lack of desire may also be seen in people who are merely not connected to or are unaware of the depths of darkness. They are, as it were, too good and have illusions about their own goodness. If one penetrates the horror of the destructive darkness of one's own nature and one's wish for death, then normally there comes the counter-reaction and a desire to live. This positive instinct springs from the realization of opposites. Living means murdering from morning to evening. We eat plants and animals. We buy the meat but do not see the slaughtering of the animals. Yet, as a matter of fact, we thus take part in the whole of nature. An Indian botanist, Sir Chandra Bose, has discovered that even plants suffer pain and even get slight temperatures when wounded. If you cut off a leaf, the plant's temperature will increase for at least two days. So vegetarians cannot have the illusion that they do not share in the wheel of destruction. We are murderers and cannot live without murdering. The whole of natural life is based on murder. That is a terrible thing to realize. But at the same time, if one is not very morbid by nature, such a realization brings acceptance and, strangely, the wish to live and the desire to accept one's guilt individually. For that is the guilt of living, and living is guilt in a certain sense. The realization of destruction and the wish to live are very closely connected. A patient's dream might illustrate what I have in mind. The dreamer had a much too high up religious idealistic attitude and therefore a split off shadow, which manifested in sudden outburst of affect, but mostly in paranoid ideas. Everything everywhere was evil, everybody had some ariare pensi, and generally these accusations were not true. Naturally, the patient herself was a dreadful liar. She dreamed that she made a religious pilgrimage and suddenly, on the left, in the house, saw a decrepit old man with a sick cat and a voice said, This is existential fear. The woman was terrified by this and asked a mature female figure, Is it true that particularly people who suffer from existential fear and nervousness love cats? The elderly woman a symbol of wisdom of nature, said yes. Then the dreamer quarreled over fifteen centimes with a very emotional shadow figure. The latter got into a rage, and the dreamer was absolutely terrified and did not know what to do. Then they both went to the mature woman, who turned to one and then the other and told both that they were right. That is, the emotional shadow figure and the frightened dreamer, too. At the back of her too high up attitude, this dreamer suffered from existential fear which is, perhaps, one of the most basic problems in cases where a child has not received enough maternal love. 
It is a deep, nervous feeling of insecurity about everything, and, in one way, the cat would be compensatory, for it is, in a natural way, egotistical. One has only to think of the symbolism of the Egyptian cat goddess Bastet to see that, mythologically, the cat is a symbol for the enjoyment of life and gaiety, and therefore, the exact opposite of existential fear. A cat walks into the room when hungry and meows and gets milk. The dog reacts more as we do and shows gratitude, but the cat is a princess. She behaves as though she were conferring an honor on you, giving you the privilege of serving her and giving her milk. Then she rubs herself against your leg and affords you the privilege of stroking her. That is so suggestive that naturally you bend down and humbly do so and feel very honored. When the cat has had enough, she walks out. She neither thanks you nor attaches herself to you. It does not matter who strokes the cat. What is important is that she gets attention. The cat is therefore something absolutely divine and the right compensation for people who have existential fear. People who suffer from such fear should cultivate the idea that they are conferring an honor on others by coming into a room and letting themselves be stroked. They should take this as a symbol. And then they would feel secure and would learn that everyone who has a negative mother complex must learn to look after themselves with the recklessness of nature. The animal does not deplore things in an infantile way, but just takes things in a way which suits them. It is man and animals and everything else for its own purposes, and that is the solution for that fear. In this woman's dream, she is under the spell of her fear, and therefore she should love cats and meditate on what they mean. If people are too sensitive, too easily frightened, and say things like, if anybody shouts at me, I can't stand it, then you may be quite sure that they themselves are tremendously aggressive in their shadow side, and vice versa. The people who explode in aggression all the time are simply cowards. They constantly explode because they are afraid. If you are aggressive and check up on yourself, you will discover this. Even animals attack when they are frightened. One should never touch a dog suddenly, for if frightened, it might bite, whereas approached quietly, it will not. Keepers in the zoo who have to look after dangerous animals know that the art lies in not frightening the animal. We react in the same way. Naturally, someone who suffers from existential fear will be dangerous, aggressive, and emotional, and that is at the root of all paranoic states and aggressiveness. The mature woman in the dream who says that both sides are right indicates the solution. She would represent the self who brings the opposites together so that fear and aggression are in the right proportion. It also shows that the problem cannot be solved by understanding, only by outgrowing it. It is one of those problems which can only be slowly and emotionally outgrow and not just conquered intellectually. It requires long practice and being less frightened on the one side and less aggressive on the other, watching one's fear while trying to give oneself security, putting a break on one's own aggressiveness until one can slowly bring those two natural elements into the right balance and thus outgrow this fatal constellation. In women, the negative mother complex often engenders a lack of the basic vital security. It is at the root of all kinds of destructiveness and inability to meet life. If one can integrate that problem emotionally, one acquires authority. There is a lot of amplificatory material on the subject of integrated aggression in Iliade's book on shamanism. In one chapter, he speaks of the shaman as the hot ones. Blacksmiths all over the world are looked on as the original medicine men and magicians because they rule the fire, and the medicine man is the man who has integrated his own devilish, dangerous element which is the secret of his authority. Integrated evil has given him authority over his tribe. Ultimately, the whole problem boils down to a fact, beautifully illustrated in an Irish fairy tale on masculine psychology, but the point applies also to feminine psychology. A hero goes into the land of the other world where a king kills all his daughter's suitors by means of a magic competition. He says to the hero, you have to hide three times and I must find you. And then I hide three times and you have to try to find me. The one who finds the other three times can behead him.
So inevitably, the king's daughter remains unmarried for a long time. Our hero comes to this country. He owns a little talking horse, which tells him to go in for the competition and that it will help him. The king consults his black magician, who tells him to hide once in a fish in a pool and once in a ring on his daughter's finger and so on. But the little talking horse always tells the hero where the king is to be found. But the king says that he will now find the hero three times and that he should go and hide. On the advice of the talking horse, the hero hides once in the horse's broken tooth and once under the hair in the horse's tail and once in the horse's hoof. The king asks the black magician for help and the latter consults all his books trying to find the hero. But there is nothing in the books about that. He can do nothing. So the hero is allowed to behead the king and marry the princess. The decisive factor in this story is that the animal is stronger than either black magician or book knowledge. The magician has supernatural powers, but it is out of a book and is codified, while the hero benefits by his horse's living wisdom. That is the only difference between the two competing powers. So it is the animal instinct which decides. Jung once went so far as to say that goodness which is beyond instinctiveness is no longer good and wickedness which is anti-instinctual cannot succeed either. If I try to be better than my instincts permit, I cease to do good. If I want to do evil in order to survive, this is only possible as long as my instinct goes with it. If I do more evil than my instinct allows, then I destroy myself. Instinct or the animal is the final judge, for that is what gives my good or evil intentions the right measure. Zhang Su gives a famous simile called breaking boxes open. It says that in order to protect oneself against boxes being opened, that is jewel cases, trunks of silken clothes and treasure, putting cords around them and a lot of locks on them is what the world calls intelligent. But if a strong thief comes, he will take the whole box on his shoulder and will hope to goodness that the locks and the cords hold so that the contents will not spill out. Zhang Su then tells of a peaceful country in Zhu where the peasants were very moral and everything was orderly. Cords and locks stand for morality and for good behavior. So the land prospered. A robber took possession of that country and was then very insistent that good behavior should continue. Everybody must continue to work and behave properly and it was now the robber who enforced this because he wanted the country to go on prospering. Neighbors, whether big or small, did not dare criticize or kill him. And for twelve generations, the country remained in his and his descendants' possession. Therefore, as you can see, robbers and thieves are very much interested in good behavior. Another story goes even further. Someone asked Zhang Su whether robbers have moral attitudes. He said, of course, for otherwise they could not be robbers. A robber must know intuitively where the treasures are to be found and that is his greatness. He must be the first to go in and that shows his courage. He must know whether a coup is possible or not and that is his wisdom. He must afterwards make a just distribution among other gangsters and that shows his goodness. It is absolutely impossible therefore for a robber to be a robber without having great moral qualities. So as you can see that as human beings need ethics in order to survive, so do robbers in order that they may be good robbers. Now there are few good and many bad people in the world, therefore obviously morality teachers do not help the world but rather cause damage. What he is really driving at is that goodness which requires an artificial effort is not goodness. It can just as well serve the purpose of the robber and, on the other hand, if a robber is a naturally good natured man, he is not a bad sort of fellow. The important thing is to be true and natural and genuine in one's own nature. That is more important than to be artificially ethical or unethical. I do more damage if I am artificial in either way than if I am just myself, instinctively and healthily. In the latter case, I also do a certain amount of damage, but since to live is to murder, the damage I cause is relatively small, which is why Chang Su always speaks against teachers of morality showing up their secret destructiveness in estranging man from his natural goodness, which is just to be, and to survive, and to cause the minimum of damage necessary for survival. Now the doll in our story is such a symbol of instinctiveness. 
but in this case it is more a fetish which has supernatural powers. Other fairy tales give parallel symbols of the helpful instinct. There is one which Barbara Hanna was also mentioned in her course on animals. It is an Austrian fairy tale called The Little White Cats. In it, a girl falls into the evil hands of her stepmother, a destructive witch who has also bewitched the ruling king of the country and turned him into a black raven which is imprisoned in a mountain beyond the frozen lake. The girl saves four little cats from drowning and cares for them, and one day they appear with a golden carriage and carry the girl across the frozen lake to the raven, which she kisses and redeems, and then becomes queen. In this case, the helpful factor is not dull, but a golden carriage drawn by four little white cats, which is otherwise a complete parallel to the doll. It is the helpful symbol which carries the heroine to her goal and brings her to her right life and makes her a queen. There we can see how much the right attitude has to do with instinct, with the instinctive totality, and how even the cat, which we consider an unethical creature, is there represented as the absolutely positive and redeeming thing. The carriage would symbolize the fourfold structure of consciousness, the instinctiveness of which one is conscious, in contrast to that instinctiveness by which one is unconsciously driven, and that would establish the correct balanced attitude. To return to the story of Vaslisa, after the stepmother and stepsisters have been burned up, Vaslisa goes to town and finds a lonely old woman with whom she decides to live. While with her, she spins such beautiful cloth that it attracts the king's attention. Through the intermediary of the lonely old woman, he asks her to make the shirts for him and then falls in love with her and she becomes queen. Afterward, she calls the lonely old woman and her father to the court so that the four live together. The father, the lonely old woman who is obviously a positive mother and replaces her dead positive mother at the beginning of the story, the king and herself the queen. So it ends with the typical quaternity the fourfold symbol of totality. It is one of the most complete stories in this sense. The story switches back and forth several times. The heroine first has a positive mother who dies. Then she falls into the hands of a stepmother who is completely destructive. Then she goes to the Baba Yaga who is destructive, but not to her. So there in the archetype, there is already more or less a balance of black and white. The Baba Yaga is only destructive to the bad side and not to the good, and she respects Vaslisa. Afterward, the story switches again to a positive mother figure, the lonely old woman in the town, who from that time on becomes her positive mother. Nothing else is said about this lonely woman, but she is obviously positive. It is a complete fourfoldness of the mother aspect which is described, and what distinguishes this last mother figure is her complete humanity. There is nothing else interesting about her. She has not even a magic doll, as did the first mother, who could not have been completely normal since she could give a magic doll to her daughter. The stepmother is completely human, but destructive. Baba Yaga is a goddess, and now we return to what one would call plain humanness as the ultimate stage of transformation. We saw before that the woman who is left alone, like Sedna in the Eskimo story, is generally evil. The Arabs still say, Never go near a woman who lives alone near the borders of the desert because such women are possessed by jinns. And it is very true that if women live alone for a long time without being in touch with men, they generally fall into the hands of the animus. It's very difficult to stand loneliness without getting overwhelmed by the unconscious, and in a woman's case, naturally by the animus. So if this woman can live alone without falling into the devil, she must, though it is so little explained in the story, be of high quality, somebody who has reached a very high level of consciousness and humanness. The need for relatedness is of the highest value and the essence of feminine nature, but a bit too much of it makes it negative because it makes that dependent clinging which men fear so much in women, and which is altogether a great evil by which women who establish relatedness so easily destroy all the good they do. If their eros which means genuine interest in the other person and in establishing relationship, being there for the other person, gets the least bit too dependent, clinging to and needing the other, it is already on the downward grade into the devouring aspect of the female. If one is attentive to one's relationships,
if one is attentive to one's relationships, it is infinitely difficult to find the right balance. Say someone you like is ill, the natural movement is to ring up and inquire, but if you do too much of this, the other feels that you want to mother and make him dependent. If you do nothing, you are not related, and if you do it, the other feels as if you had made a claim on him. Great tact is needed so that the other has no feeling of being devoured, nor is there a cold unrelatedness, and that makes the difference between positive loneliness, which means independence, and the devouring mother, the devouring female. The lonely woman, therefore, since the context shows her as a positive figure, probably here represents the ultimate capacity for independence, a feminine quality very difficult for women to acquire. It entails constant watching of one's own shadow drive, and the symbol of this independence is that lonely woman who now, in complete selflessness, becomes the intermediary between Vasilisa and the king, which makes the king aware of the girl who spins such wonderful material. The very beautiful silk shirts which attract the king have a certain parallel with the shirts in the story of the Six Swans, where the heroine had to make star flower shirts to redeem her brothers. This time, however, the king has not to be redeemed, but the heroine gets in contact via the shirts and so wins his love. He wanted the woman who could make such beautiful shirts. It is said of her spinning, weaving, and sewing that the thread is so wonderfully fine and the material so delicate that the shirts are accordingly delicate and beautiful. We say in German, my shirt is closer to me than my coat. It would imply an inner subtlety in understanding life. Such a king would not rule by regulations or make crude speeches prepared for him by his prime minister, but would be able to penetrate the actual quality of a situation in a very subtle way. That is what the differentiated anima bestows on a man and what higher consciousness gives to a woman. The capacity for living the just soness of life in the right way. Something very mysterious and very subtle. It gives the intimate attitude which can take things just as they are instead of making sweeping judgments. And it gives the subtlety of the feeling touch. Here the positive functioning of the feminine principle is not to become outwardly dominant, but to give to the ruling principle the necessary subtlety. That is what a woman can achieve. She does not need to push herself into the foreground and wear beautiful clothes. She makes them for the king, and if he wears such shirts, he will be a good king. Taken symbolically, he will be a king who can adapt to the situation, see it intimately, and have a feeling about it beyond the general coarseness of the collective reaction. If we take Vasilisa as a symbol of a woman, it would mean that she bestows subtly on her animus. Jung said that the animus is always a bit off the point, which is because it lacks subtlety. It is just this being off the point which is so irritating, as when one says something which is generally true but does not fit the actual situation. Suppose a woman's husband flirts with another woman. The wife can say that they are modern people and her husband should be free. So, she will shut her eyes to what is going on. She might be completely wrong. Perhaps, and I have seen such cases, he hopes she will put her foot down, and if she does not, he feels she does not love him, does not care much. Or her animus may tell her that she must put her foot down, that a woman must defend her rights, express her feeling, and he would only think she does not love him if she does not make a scene. So she does this and is completely wrong. For she suffocates something in her husband's anima development which should have been allowed to live. Therefore, if one follows either recipe, one is sure to be wrong. Because in all situations, there are always two possibilities and both are half true. As long as one clings to rules, one will do the wrong thing and, naturally, being driven by one's own shadow serves that anonymous argument for what one wants to do anyhow. The jealous woman who is simply driven by her jealousy will insist that a woman must defend her rights and so on. Actually, she is simply jealous. And the other will be driven in the opposite way. To give the anonymous subtlety or the right shirt would mean finding the attitude which suits the situation, knowing instinctively what is right in this special case, knowing how to act in each individual case and for that, much subtlety and individual feeling into the situation is required. On such things, the woman's animus goes off the deep end, for there is, of course, the famous partnership between shadow and animus. 
the shadow wants to do something in a driven way and the animus provides the right collective justification and then the whole situation is wrong but to be married to the king who has these beautiful shirts would mean that one had a superior way of judging the situation that would be the symbol of such shirts and that is one of the highest achievements of the feminine process of individuation the attainment of that subtle rightness which makes Vasilisa a queen the latter symbolizes a model of femininity for the new age to come.